Hey guys, it's Anand Shapu from Anantech.com. This is the Anantech Mobile Show. We're live here at Google I.O. Uh, brought to you by Intel Mobile. I want to recap some of the day's announcements, events that have happened here at I.O. Um, live from San Francisco. Uh, the news started out with the introduction of Android One. Um, the idea is that Google's obviously had incredible success with Android um, at the high end and the mainstream uh, kind of in developed countries, but it's really about scaling you know, how do you get to the next 5 billion mobile users? Android One is, is one part of the strategy there. The idea is that uh, Google will work with traditional uh, silicon and platform vendors to build a hardware reference platform. Uh, the, the platform that they talked about today is sub $100, four and a half inch display, uh, dual SIM, no idea about underlying specs, but you're talking about sub $100 smartphones here, really aimed at the next 5 billion users. Um, the big difference with Android One is it's running stock Android and updates are handled directly from Google. So you can think about it as Nexus, but just for everyone else. Um, so we should be hearing about that more um, uh, by the end of the year. The, the big story, obviously, was Android L. So this is the successor of KitKat. I don't know why they didn't announce a name um, other than just to say it's L. Um, uh, it's a developer preview at this point. You'll see first code release tomorrow um, with Nexus 5 and Nexus 7 images being posted, um, as well as the source itself. So L brings a whole bunch of new features. Um, there's something like 5,000 new developer APIs, but I want to touch on some of the high points here. Um, so material design, um, Holo is out. Uh, new UI, new UX, um, they call it material, bold new colors, big focus on animations, uh, things like touch feedback ripples, uh, real-time soft shadows, um, so you know, uh, providing depth to uh, a lot of the layers and uh, windows and cards that appear on the screen. Um, activity transitions, you know, huge focus on, on transitions, not only within an app, but between an app and between tasks. Uh, big focus on material. Uh, it's a unified design approach that Google wants to see extended not only on the phone, but also on the tablet and everything else, so TV, even down to the web. Uh, so this is a really, really big deal, and Google honestly has done an excellent job showing this sort of unified front and face to, to all of its screens that, that face consumers. Uh, I think this is a huge step forward. From a user's perspective, um, you could argue that there's a little bit uh, a decrease in information density, at least based on the applications that you know Google showed off, such as the redesigned Gmail. Uh, but in terms of look and feel, it's it's definitely a lot cleaner. Um, so we'll you know people who've got uh, Nexus fives and Nexus sevens, they'll be able to check that out tomorrow uh, at developer.google.com. A um, couple other changes uh, that I want to touch on. Uh, so with KitKat Web View uh, moved to Chromium based. Uh, so this was uh, I think it launched with Chromium thirty. And at 4.4.3, um, they moved it to Chromium 33. Um, with, with L release, that moves to Chromium 36. Uh, so there are a handful of updates there, uh, WebGL support, things like that. Uh, one of the biggest features of L release is going to be Dalvik's out. Um, they've moved to Art as the not only uh, an optional runtime, not just the default runtime, but the only runtime within Android. Uh, so you get Art. Um, along with Art, you get 64-bit support across the board. So all the major architectures now have 64-bit support in Android. Um, so that's ARM, that's x86, and MIPS. Uh, this is a huge deal um, for a number of reasons. Obviously, later this year, we're going to see a lot of 64-bit ARM-based SOCs. The Intel mobile SOCs are obviously already 64-bit enabled. Uh, and then you know MIPS is there as well. Uh, so real big deal. Um, Google's talking about huge performance increases for, for Art versus Dalvik. Um, we've talked about a bit of this, you know, as it stands. I mean, Dalvik's fairly, fairly well optimized from companies like Qualcomm and stuff like that. But uh, I think with Art, with what they've been uh, uh, working on this far, um, we, we should see a, a decent improvement to things like uh, uh, garbage collection, not only in, uh, you know, Google provided a lot of examples where the frequency of garbage collection has also been reduced, as well as the, the kind of duration of these GC routines. Um, the end result is you get smoother overall user experience, better overall performance. Uh, art supports ahead of time compilation, just in time compilation, as well as uh, interpreted code, all of that's supported. Uh, and the beauty of the, the move to art is everything works out of the box. The developers don't really have to do anything differently. You know, the device should just end up being faster. Along the lines of performance, uh, power is a, a very, very important component of all of this. Uh, Project Volta is another component of, of the L release of Android. Um, and Android, uh, Google shared a couple of really, really interesting uh, data points uh, in one of the sessions earlier today that I attended. Uh, so 
it profiled a Nexus 5, and it found that roughly every one second of unnecessary active time, right? So that's the cellular modem waking up for no good reason, for no you know appreciable work, the apps processor waking up for no appreciable work. For every one second of active time, unnecessary active time on a Nexus 5, that reduced total standby time, so idle screen off, you know, phone in your pocket, that reduced standby time but roughly two minutes. So every one, minute, one second of an unnecessary active time resulted in a two-minute penalty to standby time. Now, if you multiply all that out, let's say you've got 50 apps, each one of them that does one second of unnecessary standby time per hour, that's 100 minutes, or unnecessary active time per hour, that's 100 minutes of, of standby time per hour that you're giving up. Uh, and you do that over eight hours or a full day, and you can see how uh, this stuff tends to add up. Uh, so Google really wants to address this problem, and they're doing it with an approach that they like to call uh, lazy first. So basically, if your application doesn't need you know, uh, uh, immediate access to CPU performance, immediate access to network connectivity, then you shouldn't schedule those, applica- those operations or those jobs you know, uh, on a first come, first serve basis. Instead, what you want to do is you want to delay them to the last possible, last possible moment uh, and kind of coalesce as many of these things as possible so that the device wakes up, runs through everything it needs to do, and then goes back to sleep and can stay asleep for as long as possible. If that sounds very familiar to you. It's it's a lot of what Microsoft focused on uh, in Windows 8. It's a lot of what Apple did with uh, OS X Mavericks, um, job coalescing, uh, timer coalescing, all of this stuff. Uh, Google wants to get more of its third-party developers doing this on Android. And in pursuit of this, it's introducing a new API in L release called Job Scheduler. So Job Scheduler allows developers to do exactly this, uh, which is you can schedule jobs and schedule tasks so that they're as lazy as possible uh, and only run them when you absolutely need to. Uh, now, so these are this is useful for tasks that don't necessarily need immediate feedback. Uh, so we're talking about things like, you know, let's say you're uploading logs to a database um, based on user activity or something like that. You know, these are not uh, jobs that'll be uh, user facing. Um, So if you're, you know, playing a game or or running a video transcode process uh, where the user is expecting immediate results, obviously that's not stuff that you want to be lazy first about. But everything else, um, you know, if it it can be delayed, there's now an API to help you delay it. Um, And the ways you can, the ways you can delay these, uh, these jobs and these calls uh, it, it's, it's actually pretty neat. So you can delay based on the availability of network connectivity. So you can say, hey, I only want to run this whenever there's Wi-Fi, uh, or I want to run this as soon as there's any network connectivity, or if there's any cellular connectivity, uh, or if SMS is available, right? You can do it based on all of that. You can also run jobs based on uh, the state of charging the device. So, hey, these are tasks that are very CPU intensive. I only want to run them when the device is plugged in. Uh, and you can also set uh, kind of uh, periods where you want certain jobs to run. So, hey, this job needs to run, uh, you know, anywhere in the next five to fifteen minutes. It has to run in fifteen minutes, but it doesn't really need to run before then. Uh, and then the idea is, if all of your apps on your platform uh, leverage the job scheduler API, that you can actually get some nice coalescing effects where you don't have every app fending for itself to try and. Uh, kind of immediately push out data or immediately schedule stuff on the CPU, but instead you get these nice bursts of work, then no work. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense. We've seen this used on mobile devices. You know, it was a, it was a big push with the release of Haswell. Um, so it's good to see this kind of coming to Android. Uh, and in some of the simulations that Google ran, uh, you know, we're talking about 15, 20% increase in battery life on, you know, a simulated workload on a Nexus 5. Now that's not saying that we'll definitely see that, but if you know, the third-party apps that you use start using this, um, start le- leveraging Job Scheduler API, uh, then, you know, it's it's feasible that we can see that sort of a gain without any change to hardware. Um, so this is a big deal and, and a, a, a definitely a big part of uh, making Android more mature and, and more polished. Uh, the other big news is the introduction of the Android expansion pack. So features like Geometry shaders, compute shaders, tessellation, these are all features that we have in DX11. Uh, They're features that exist on modern high-end game consoles. Uh, They don't presently exist in mobile on the Android platform. Uh, So the idea is how do you bridge where we are with OpenGL ES to this kind of high-level feature set that we need for 
uh, bringing high quality PC games and console like games to, to mobile devices. And the impetus for this is really that, you know, honestly, we've got NVIDIA's Tegra K1 coming out. Um, you know, obviously Qualcomm's Adreno 4XX family uh, and, and, you know, Imagination's got some interesting stuff coming out as well. So you've got this push for high performance mobile GPU uh, devices out there. And you really need to, you know, attract high-end game developers. And one of the features that they need is they need the ability to port their big old engines from uh, the PC side and, and from the high-end console side, unmodified over to modal, uh, over to mobile, and unmodified as much as possible. So Google introduced uh, the Android exp- uh, expansion expansion pack. Uh, it adds a lot of these support uh, support for things like tessellation, compute shaders, geometry shaders, uh, without going to um, you know, a full-blown OpenGL implementation under uh, under Android. So it's kind of an in-between, um, and it's something that uh, we'll see support from Qualcomm, NVIDIA, all these guys for. Uh, in fact, uh, at the show, they demonstrated um, Unreal Engine 4, the desktop renderer, running on Tegra K1 on Android L um, and, and leveraging the expansion pack. So huge deal, big component of all of this. Uh, so that kind of wraps up Android L. Um, we'll have more on Android L tomorrow once the developer previews out. Uh, but that was definitely not the last thing uh, that Google talked about at I.O. today. So Android TV, another huge component of all of this. Uh, this is yet another attempt for Google to get into the TV space, but honestly, it's the most sensible one yet. Uh, the idea here is that this is not a separate device or a separate OS. Um, it's Android. It just allows you to run... Uh, uh, more easily develop for Android running on TVs. Uh, the idea is that you would have one APK um, and with some help on uh, the API side, have support for a lean back mode. Um, so basically just like you have a, uh, you know, you might have a single AP- APK that targets smartphone and tablet uh, and presents a different view depending on which device you have, uh, you'd simply have a third view. And that third view would be for a 10 foot UI experience. Um, so Android TV, uh, big potential deal, you know, if you've got uh, folks that are integrating the OS into their TVs, uh, you know, we've we've seen some announcements from folks that are going to be building top boxes around this, uh, Asus and Razer among the two there. Uh, Silicon Partners, you know, Google seems to have everyone, NVIDIA is going to be a part of it, um, Intel's a part of it, uh, you've got MediaTek, Broadcom, uh, Marvell, all these guys seem to be signed up for it. Uh, and again, I think that the key feature here is that this is just Android running on the TV. It's not Google TV. It's not a, uh, it's, it's not one of those plays again, but rather, you know, focus on, hey, if you're a developer, here's an easy way to make sure, or, or a set of guidelines and a set of APIs that you can use to uh, enable a 10-foot UI experience. Um, so it seems like a sensible approach. Um, I, I'd love to see higher performance silicon and uh, kind of less proprietary, less fragmented OS approach in, in a lot of the TV OSs that we have out there. Um, so we'll see where it goes. We're supposed to see devices, again, starting the end of this year. Uh, obviously, the other big news here is Android Wear. Uh, so Google announced Android Wear as a platform a few months ago. Uh, we saw the announcement and ship dates of devices from LG and Samsung. We'll have our hands-on, our review samples of those devices tomorrow. Um, so I won't say too much about it here, other than these are Snapdragon 400 based SO, um, based platforms. They're running Android Wear, uh, same kind of deal. You know, a lot of Android Wear, uh, a lot of the APIs that are available on that platform are the same exact APIs available on Android. Uh, this seems to really be the the common theme here um, for this year's I/O. It's it's that you've got multiple screens, multiple types of devices, um, whether it's TV or even car or or a wearable device. And all of them run effectively the same uh, base of Android. Now, maybe some things are more available on certain devices and not others. Um, I'm not expecting Android Expansion Pack to be a, a killer feature on Android Wear. But the idea is that you know anyone developing one APK over here, um, you know, can easily extend that to a different screen or a different type of device. Um, obviously, notifications and dealing with all of that was a, a big part of the Android Wear story here. Um, but again, we'll, we'll get into a lot more of that tomorrow as we, uh, um, as we get hands-on and, and start playing around with our review, review de- devices there. 
uh, the Moto 360, that's the, the circular-faced watch that everyone's really excited about. Um, it's been on demo. Uh, we'll get our review devices later this summer. Uh, honestly, it just doesn't seem like it's ready yet. Uh, but the, the two square devices from, uh, from Samsung and LG, those will be shipping in early July. Um, and like I said, they're handing out devices tomorrow. Uh, and then the last big thing uh, from the show is really uh, something that was unexpected for me, but I, I think a huge, huge announcement, um, which is the fact that Google is starting to work on porting uh, Android apps to Chrome OS. Uh, so this isn't a broad, hey, we're moving everything to Chrome OS announcement, but certain apps, the ones that make sense, Google seems to be vested in, in porting them over. And honestly, I think this makes a lot of sense, right? If I look at the Chrome OS and the Chromebook um, value proposition, you effectively get uh, a really, really good value notebook, right? And, and it has a great web browser, and it tends to be very speedy because, you know, it's effectively just running a web browser. And a lot of these things have, especially the x86 versions that are running Haswell, um, they're, they're high performance. The downside is they don't have many thick client apps. Um, the ones they have aren't very good. And, you know, some, uh, uh, I, I always said if, if you could take the Play Store and, and brought it, bring it over to Chrome OS, that, you know, that would do wonders for it. Um, and, and that's exactly what Google seems to be doing here. Um, the trick is to make sure that in the transition from bringing some of these Play Store apps from these Android apps over to Chrome OS, that you still have the same quality of experience so that they properly lend themselves to keyboard and mouse usage. Um, but but that seems to be what Apple uh, what uh, Google is working on, and I think it it makes tons of sense. And if you're Microsoft, it's a um, potentially very very worrisome thing. Um, if you look at the quality of what you get if you spend three hundred dollars on a Chromebook um, versus a three hundred dollar Windows PC, the latter is more capable for sure because you have the client apps and and you know this this long history of applications that you can run. But if Google ever bridges that gap, the hardware experience tends to be a lot bigger, a lot better on Chrome OS. Um, so I think that's a huge announcement, uh, one that potentially has uh, you know a decent amount of legs, a decent set of legs, and, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, potential for for kind of exploiting that platform in the future. We got to keep an eye on it. You know, Google made it very very clear that this is the early days of an announcement. Um, it's not something that. Uh, you know, they even attached a date to for when we'll see like a full transition and full availability of Android apps on Chrome OS. But again, I think it's a huge deal. Um, but yeah, in a nutshell, that's that's Google I.O. thus far. Uh, so we'll have more coverage later on this week. Um, definitely tons of sessions tomorrow um, and a lot of really interesting stuff happening here. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching. And uh, be sure to check out the site for more updates tomorrow.